Before the following our keynote speaker, I would like to invite the Deputy Chairman of the Cabinet of Ministers of the Kyrgyz Republic, Edil Baisalov. Excellencies, honorable guests, dear friends, it's a great honor for me to welcome you to Bishkek. I am delighted to see so many familiar faces and to meet new ones. I can confidently say that I know almost all the Rumsfeld Fellows from Kyrgyzstan, many are good friends. And of course, I have heard uh, much about many of you from our neighboring countries. This Kamka network represents a remarkable organization, fostering friendships and providing invaluable opportunities to learn from one another and work together. Over the years, several of my friends have invited me to join them at Kamka events in South Caucasus, Mongolia, and other countries, boasting of all the good times and inspirational moments one gets from attending. To my regret, I never followed up, but I fully understand the importance of the camaraderie and fun these gatherings offer. It's also a pleasure to see Professor Frederick Starr, whom I have known for many years, I believe I had the honor of speaking at his esteemed Central Asia Caucasus Institute in Washington not only once, but twice. And of course, the uh, professor, you remain, and your think tank remains the preeminent pre global think tank uh, for our region's discourse. So, dear ladies and gentlemen, I, to all of you, I extend a warm a warm welcome to Kyrgyzstan. I am honored by this invitation to speak here. I intend to provide an overview of the current state uh, of the nation in Kyrgyzstan, reflect on regional dynamics and explore perhaps how can we project our situation into the coming years. Usually my boss, Prime Minister uh, Akhlbek Japarov, uses many, many slides, he would have used 40 and 50. Uh, I entertain the idea of borrowing some of his slides, but uh, perhaps I will forego, and uh, I will also try to keep my, uh, these uh, uh, remarks brief, as I believe there is an opportunity for some back and forth, and I would pr much prefer to engage directly with you. Firstly, let us discuss the current state of Kyrgyzstan. Under the leadership of President Sadr Japarov, we have made significant strides in political stability, economic growth, and social development. Key achievement is doubling our GDP in nominal terms. A year and a half ago, we declared about doubling our government revenue. For those of you who do not know, our current president uh, was elected in January 2021. So we're talking about three and three and a half years. So I, I know that many of you have experience in government and you can imagine how does it feel for the state and government if your revenue doubles within two years. Uh, the tax collection increased three times. Customs duties increased four times. This is no small feat. This is Operation Clean Hands. This is how honest government looks like. This is how democracy looks like. This is good governance and effective public administration. Truly remarkable progress Kyrgyzstan has made in economic 
development over the past years. Again, I'm not going to be boasting about 300 schools we have built, uh, more than doubling our public salaries, teacher salaries, you know, uh, our doctors will be hearing many good news in the coming weeks. Um, but I'd like to say that in such a short time, we have turned this country around. And despite facing numerous challenges, our nation has demonstrated resilience and a steadfast commitment to growth and prosperity. Just early this week, we received figures for GDP growth for the first five months. And I'm delighted to say that it is 8.1%. But actually, without our gold sector, you know, gold production can, uh, uh, can uh, come up, uh, can, you know, sometimes fall. The real growth of our sector, of our economy, outside uh, uh, gold mining is actually uh, close to 9.8%. Thank you. Our current GDP in World Bank terms is around 14 billion US dollars. And our president has put goal of doubling this GDP, more than doubling, of bringing, uh, raising this by to 30 billion USD by 2030. And then, after achieving that, we think, I personally believe, we will uh, get to 30 billion before 2030. Uh, comparatively easy task. But then, we, our leadership is planning uh, for, to build, a, to, to lay the ground to, to, uh, for building 200 billion dollar economy by 2050. To reach these goals is required average 10% economic growth every year. And I know it's not easy to sustain uh, these figures, but this is only 25 years, and we know from many countries that it is achievable. Uh, I do want to talk, I don't want to uh, talk too much about the economy. Uh, I'd like to reflect on our rather current state of our intra-regional, intra Central Asia. Uh, and I'd like to, to call on you to celebrate the current state of intra-regional trust and stability we are enjoying today in Central Asia. With only one exception, we see today very high levels of personal and country-to-country -country multilateral engagement between, both our, uh, all, between our presidents. And then, of course, these contacts uh, that we know are frequent uh, and are reported in the press, but also there are many frequent contacts that do not get reported in the press. This enhanced cooperation is a testament to our shared commitment to regional peace and prosperity. A prime example of this cooperation is the historic bilateral treaty signed last year between Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan, securing 100% of our borders. This treaty was considered only a few years ago an, an unattainable goal by many experts and scholars. Dr. Starr can confirm that there are dozens and dozens of books and hundreds of articles that believe that resolving these complex issue issues was impossible. They always, and I heard myself, that they believed the Kyrgyz and the Uzbeks will never agree that this border was designed that way, that these countries will never agree on securing and signing a border treaty. So, my friends, this is truly a historic breakthrough, a testament to our ability to overcome challenges, and also we need to celebrate political leadership and vision of both our presidents, Sadr Japarov and Shavkat Mirziyoyev. 
While the significance of this achievement cannot be overstated, it has paved the way for greater regional stability and cooperation, which we must celebrate and build upon. The progress we have made in fostering regional stability is a remarkable success story. This new era of trust and collaboration opens the door to shared prosperity benefiting all our nations. I'd like to say that, of course, I see uh, Ambassador Wahabov, uh, but I also, before I was invited to join this government, I enjoyed my six pre-COVID months in London and then a year and a half in captivity in lockdown. But in those first six months in London, whenever I went, it was August uh, 2019 to March 2020, and whenever I went in London, and whenever I was asked a question, and uh, you know, to reflect uh, upon, uh, you know, what is going on in Central Asia or in Kyrgyzstan, I would say that the best news in Central Asia is the new president of Uzbekistan, Mr. Shafkat Mirziyoyev. President Mirziyoyev changed our region for the better. From day one, he came and opened his uh, heart and opened borders of Uzbekistan. He turned to all of us and I think we really felt that he gave all of us a good hug. And then of course, that's what I said in 2019 in London, and that's what I'm going to repeat here, that it takes one man, one true leader, to change history for the better. So let us all celebrate the vision and uh, historical achievements of uh, President Mirziyoy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are witnessing unprecedented economic growth and development across Central Asia. Our economies are becoming more integrated, trade and investment flows are increasing, and infrastructure projects are connecting our countries, reconnecting, let's uh, put this way, and then of course I'd like to uh, celebrate uh, what was achieved last year, last week, in Beijing, uh, three transport ministers of Kyrgyzstan, China, and Uzbekistan signed the historic agreement uh, they put on paper that later this year, the railroad connecting our three countries, and this, I personally believe that naming this railroad China, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan is, uh, um, doesn't describe what it truly is. I come myself from the uh, region from that I recently went to Narin and I said to governor of Narin that we should of course describe it not uh, China, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan railroad. We should say that this is Paris and Shanghai. Uh, Paris, Narin, Shanghai <laughs> railroad. You know, and uh, this, this railroad, again, many people believed that this, this is not going to work, that, this, uh, that we will never, and then of course, we, we've, we've, we've been discussing it for 25 years. You know that this has been in, um, in five-year plans, like five, uh, four, four or five, five-year plans of the Communist Party of China, and it never took, again, you know, our previous presidents, they never really were brave enough to launch this railroad and our current president actually committed to building this uh, during his term. Uh, we also, I have to actually uh, go soon back to work because um, our prime minister is back from Vienna and uh, again uh, yesterday and uh, on Monday and Tuesday he hosted in Vienna uh, first road show for Kambarata 1 hydro station. This will be also a joint uh, Kyrgyz, Uzbek and Kazakh uh, project that will uh, see building the first dam uh, 
besides stock toggle, the existing one, that will help us manage our uh, water resources better. I like to also reflect on, of course, on uh, CASA 1000. We heard both uh, Dr. Starr and I believe uh, Donald Lu talk about CASA 1000 and the North and South, but uh, you know, we recently have, of course, uh, are working together with Pakistan and China so that the historic Karakurum Highway that connects, you know, we are a landlocked or land -linked, linked country. You know, we, in Kyrgyzstan, we represent the geographic point that is most distant from any world ocean. And so our closest seaport to Kyrgyzstan is, of course, Karachi in Pakistan. And so recently, our government of Pakistan has declared uh, and with the support of the Chinese authorities, that the Karakurum Highway is going to turn into a round-the-year operation. And that will again mean that Kyrgyzstan will become the gateway for South Asia into uh, Central Asia and larger Eurasian space. And this also represents a very good opportunity for our country. And we also, of course, discussing that perhaps we will build the, um, um, the electricity line this, uh, along this Karakurum Highway that will perhaps come sooner into operation than the CASA 1000 that is being uh, built and discussed for many, many years. And also one more fact that was achieved and it was never even celebrated, not even in, not in the international press, but even our local press didn't really pick up. For many, many years, the Kyrgyz leadership has tried to persuade the Chinese authorities to open the electric grid uh, of China. It was never agreed. And last year, last year uh, after many, many uh, good uh, conversations, uh, the um, member of the Politburo, the current uh, secretary of the party in uh, uh, Urumqi, Xinjiang, uh, Mr. Ma, he agreed to open the electricity grid of China. And you can only imagine that this is the largest electricity market with the prices, you know, 10 times larger than what we produce. And I was, I didn't really understand the significance, but I remember I was having a conversation with uh, EDF, you know, the French electricity uh, energy company. And they, they literally, they, uh, I don't know what happened to them. They were looking at each other. They, for them, this was a real game changer. Because even before then, building hydro, solar, and other projects here in Kyrgyzstan was lucrative and attractive. We made sure that uh, we made so to attract that investment. But then, of course, it, when they heard that we are connecting to the Chinese electricity grid, that they said this is a truly a game changer. Ladies and gentlemen, you know, I also would like to reflect, if time is permitting, uh, on the recent remarks by our president. A few weeks ago, speaking to the Forum on Social Mobilization, he reflected on our first 30 years of uh, independence. And he also, of course, said that we were mistaken. And I think it was the first time when truly it was articulated that in the after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Kyrgyzstan became the, first, the best student of Bretton Woods institutions, and we pursued this policy of neoliberal politics. And I don't blame the then president, because you know, many of us were very enthusiastic supporters of that course. But, of course, we have to say that the idea of this trickle-down economics 
the, of the idea of the minimal state, the idea of privatizing and outsourcing everything did not work. It enriched perhaps a hundred, a thousand, a few thousand families, and it left our country in ruins. We became the world champions in reliance on foreign remittances. We competed not only with our brotherly Tajikistan, but with the Pacific island of Tonga. 35, up to 35% of our GDP until recently was made of remittances. The promise that some invisible hand will come and will change and will just, you know, make us all prosper prosperous in uh, Switzerland of Asia did not bear fruit. It resulted in a collapse, in near collapse. A failed state that we saw very clearly in July 2020 when we were dealing with COVID. Therefore, the consolidation of the state that we are witnessing today is a good thing. It already resulted in improving many, many lives. And of course, I can say, also share, uh, citing the recent public opinion poll by International Republican Institute, it is the Americans themselves that they say that President Sadr Japarov, with his 82% approval rating, according to Gallup, is the current world number one state leader in enjoying such diverse and strong public support. Following that speech by President Sadr Japarov, our Prime Minister, Mr. Akhlbek Japarov, he continued and developed, and then, of course, he went to this uh, international financial uh, forum where he talked about state capitalism, how we are going to, how the state is not only the a conductor of our orchestra, but will play the role of the first violin. Uh, and that, but he, he promised that this will be very short, that the state enterprises will be opening uh, will act as a locomotive and will open new industries, will open, will expand the economy and state investment and capital resources. And then, of course, with the state uh, banks. Um, but he promised that this will be short, that around two, by 2030, or around two, 2030, of course, we really want to enter the international financial markets and pursue privatization, I, uh, IPO, or he wants to say it's people's IPO, and uh, let our private sector fly. But he continued his uh, discussions, and then, of course, he reflected on all the... Um, and he suggested that we call the model of the state uh, that we are trying to build uh, it's maybe perhaps a play of words, or maybe he's pursuing something new, or maybe he's uh, reflecting something on old, but he, try he suggested that we call what we are building an authoritative state, not authoritarian. He was uh, actually arguing that it is not authoritarian, but authoritative. Authoritative государство, не авторитарное, авторитетное. Why? Because we have to remember that in Kyrgyzstan we have a real electoral democracy. And as a civic activist who fought for this, I am very proud to say that we won. In our country, elections are free and fair. President Sadir Japarov elected in January 21, or our current parliament elected in November 21, no one can say that any results were tackled with. I always say and remind our international guests, uh, especially Europeans, you know, it's a very touchy topic for our American friends, uh, the, at 8 p.m., when our public, uh, 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 when our, uh, this polling stations close, 
At 8 p.m., the Europeans will turn on their television and they will see exit polls. At 8 p.m., well, one minute, maybe a few seconds, we see the results in Kyrgyzstan because we've built the state-of-the-art system where the voters have one vote, it is ensured by state-of-the-art biometric identification, they vote on a paper ballot, it gets scanned, and then these results are aggregated and projected to the whole nation the moment the, uh, the uh, elections close. There is not a single moment for anybody to tackle with the results, to try to falsify. And we all, you know, I spent my youth fighting all those who used to falsify our elections. Uh, so authoritative state, we are a democracy. We are an electoral democracy, and this, uh, we have elections to prove it. It is founded on the rule of law, argues our prime minister. Again, until very recently, this country, and again, we use this word uh, mafia very officially, because we had the situation where few of our citizens were on the FBI most wanted list. One was siphoning off up to $1 billion of customs revenue of our country. I'm not going to honor his name by naming him. Uh, and another one was a mob leader. They became the best friends, the organized crime leader and these customs officials who uh, both of these people, many of uh, my friends here, we all believed that they somehow managed to install this current uh, leadership. But actually, the skeptics were proven wrong. Our state was liberated from both of these people. So the rule of law, uh, the real rule of law is being installed. We are very far from achieving the full um, specter, but mafia state no more. And then, of course, this authoritative state is genuinely interested in improving lives and has the, and we have, we have the clear investment in human capital to prove it. So, an authoritative state relies on the rule of law, protects citizens' rights, and ensures stability and security. The state is strong and responsible for the well-being of its citizens, creating conditions for their development and prosperity. Well, I two things that I need to uh, conclude uh, around this. Uh, I thank you for your attention and once again welcome you all to Kyrgyzstan. And uh, we. Do we have time for questions and answers yeah. or not? Dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear our distinguished participants and the guests, welcome to Bishkek. Yes. Nazira <laughs> Bishanaliva. So on behalf of Kyrgyz fellows, we are re really delighted to see you in Bishkek, and we wish you amazing and exciting, memorable stay in our country. So. Uh, your Excellency Edil Baisala, thank you very much for your welcome speech and for your support. I want to take this advantage and the opportunity to build up somehow communication between our guests. And we are ready to answer for two questions from the uh, forum participants. So if you have any questions, uh, uh, microphone is yours. And after that, uh, we are ready to let you go for your yes, routine. Yes. Any questions? No questions. I think, no, there should be questions. Everything is self-explanatory. <laughs> yes, but anyways, I'd like to... Yes, you know, uh, Edil. Uh, my name is Fuad. I am a, a guest from uh, Azerbaijan. Thank you very much for your welcome remarks. Uh, my question is about uh, C plus uh, 
forum and C plus movement. I know the Central Asia are now united uh, in uh, building the uh, joint union in cooperation and uh, B plus as well is uh, B5, excuse me, C5 plus and B5 plus. Uh, what's your expectation about that? And what's your expectation about the middle corridor as well toward the European markets, toward the uh, Black Sea, Caspian Sea, and so on? Maybe you can touch upon about that a little bit. Thank you very much. Well, I think one of the significant Uh, facts about Central Asia today is that there is this internal cohesion and harmony and our leaders, they all talk to each other, they discuss many of the regional developments and global developments and they try to at least discuss, if not coordinate, exchange notes. This, never, uh, this hasn't been always the fact. So today in Central Asia we have that. And then of course I believe that you know, C5, uh, we have you know, the dialogue with uh, United States, we have you know, with many countries, you know, with China, Japan, Korea, Germany, I think, you know, even, you know, all countries, they sort of want to economize and they want to meet all five. You know, one of the things, of course, we're really uh, looking forward when the uh, U.S. president, well, not the next one, perhaps after that, uh, hopefully, uh, Dr. Starr, you and I, we need to be guests at the state banquet in the White House where all five Central Asian presidents will be uh, six. As, is Azerbaijan, well, that's your vision. Uh, actually, I am wearing today the uh, tie for COP29 uh, for Baku this year. And of course, Azerbaijan is our very, very uh, close partner and friendship, both between our peoples and Presidency is uh, strength, being strengthened every day. So there are many, many, many things. We understand that there is this... Um, our president always talks about his vision for shared prosperity. That borders must be set, but then they must open. So we need to trade, we need to have people-to-people -people contact, and many of those things. And I think, you know, C5 and B5, I think relationship with the United States of America is obviously very, very important. But uh, uh, it is, uh, and it is a very healthy relationship at the moment. I think, I don't know, but uh, the current Kyrgyz-American relationship, uh, one can argue, has never been better. You know, it can improve, it can definitely go many, many ways, but there is this trust and, and there is this uh, uh, relationship. Hopefully it could have been followed up by some economic investment, but we know it is, uh, it is uh, far off. Anyways, thank you very much. It was a great uh, uh, opportunity for me to address you all, and I do truly value this invitation, and I wish you all of success. And Enjoy your time in Bishkek.